Steve here. It's the show where I answer your questions, and this week my first question comes from Ahoy or No. I use the humanist definition that defines evil as that which causes unnecessary suffering. Under that definition, the ringleaders of YouTube anti-feminism are evil. Their goal appears to be to cause unnecessary suffering and harm for their entertainment. Am I going too out of my way here? How do you define evil? And how does that word apply to the people who lie about your family? Uh, you would have to define the term evil in a very outside-of-the-box way in order for it to not apply to people who lie about my family. Or lie about other people's family. Or, as you say in your citing of the humanist definition, cause unnecessary suffering, particularly when it's done willfully for their own entertainment or their own profit, as YouTube anti-feminists and white supremacists, you know, Islamophobes, xenophobes, the basic shitlord community. That, that, that's what they do. They, they attack and harass and abuse people and whip up anger and intolerance and hatred against groups of people that they view as, as worthy of attack. And they do this for their own uh, entertainment because they think it's funny and because it makes them money. And yeah, I think that's evil. Is it as evil as murder? No, I wouldn't say it rises to that level. Is it as evil as child molestation? Certainly not, although it must be noted that a lot of the folks in that group seem to be pretty okay with child molestation, or at least with those who condone child molestation, as long as that person is more or less on their side of things. If it's, if it's a quote-unquote SJW who they catch a whiff of uh, child molestation tolerance off of, well, then it's, it's game over. Then it's all bets are off. That's a horrible, terrible, evil person. But if it's one of ours, well, let's try to find the nuance in his position, you know? So even child molestation might not be totally evil from their perspective. Depends on who's doing it. Right. But uh, yeah, I don't think they're the most evil people in the world. I don't think it's I mean, I think we can afford to use the term uh, in varying degrees. There are varying senses of evil. You know, uh, there's a more generic kind of evil that people use to describe just something that is that is intolerable or undesirable. And then you go on up to sort of Nazi evil, where it's like the most unimaginably horrible thing you, you have ever you know, encountered. Um, you can call all of that evil in varying ways. That's one of the nice things about language, is that words have different definitions in different senses that we can detect and determine based on the context of what someone is saying. So, yeah, do I think that, that uh, YouTube anti-feminists meet the definition of evil? Do I think it is appropriate to use that term to refer to them in some sense? Absolutely. Fuck them. Fuck every last goddamn one of them. What they do certainly is evil, and it shouldn't be tolerated by this platform or any other platform. Unless they want to be a pro-evil platform. In which case, have at it. Rashid QE, hey Steve, do you think that atheists can make any noticeable movement forward in society without the more negative atheists, racist, anti-feminist, united with the more positive atheists? I personally believe that the only qualification to champion atheist beliefs should be a lack of faith. But as a black person who has encountered racism, I can understand why people do not want to work with racist and anti-feminist atheists. But I do believe without them and their followers, atheists don't really stand a chance of making a noticeable change. What are your thoughts? It's going to sound pretty harsh, but if atheists as a group aren't able to realize positive change for ourselves without relying on racists and sexists and homophobes and transphobes, etc. in our midst, then we probably don't deserve it anyway. I mean, if our group is that toxic that we literally cannot accomplish good things for our group without platforming and supporting and enabling and perpetuating people who hold those absolutely toxic, vile points of view and, and do those terrible things, if, if the only way we can win or, or achieve progress is with them, then to hell with it. What are we even doing here? What is the point? What is the point of, of, of elevating our group if our group is so fucking toxic that we cannot achieve progress for atheists unless we unite and wrap our arms around the fucking racists and the homophobes and the misogynists and the transphobes and the Islamophobes and all the other fucking awful villains that 
too often are the most visible atheist faces, especially online, you know, particularly here on YouTube. Um, if, if, we, if we can't do it without them, then is it really even worth doing? Scott Bresinger, an ethical dilemma for you. An anonymous benefactor offers you a large and reliable revenue stream to continue your work and improve the quality of your life. You would be allowed to talk about just about anything you want, any way you want, except you are not to mention atheism or criticize religion in any substantive way. Would you take the offer in hopes of renegotiating later on or reject it, suspecting this person has ulterior motives? Basically, would you compromise in order to achieve a tangible personal goal? If it was a limited time thing, if somebody came to me and said, look, I'll put you under contract for two years and you'll make a shit ton more money than you're making now and you can basically continue to do what you've been doing, but uh, just lay off the atheism and religion stuff, I don't know, I might take that deal. And if I still felt okay about it in, at the end of the contract and my benefactor wanted to renew for another few years, like, I, I would certainly consider that. Now, would I be willing to swear off talking about atheism and, and, and religion for the rest of my life? Probably not. Or we would at least have to be talking about a shitload of money. You know what I mean? Like, it would have to be like set for life type money. Um, but no, I, for a limited time, for someone to, and, and for someone to make it really, really worth my while financially to say, look, keep making the YouTube videos, keep talking about everything you always talk about, but just lay off the atheism and religion stuff for a few years, I would be tempted. I, don't, I can't say I definitely would do it, but I would be tempted to do it if it would make a better life for me and, and my family. And then if I could save my money during that period, and then if I wasn't comfortable with it after the contract runs out, I can go back to doing what I was doing. I can, I can resume talking about atheism and skepticism and, and, and religion all I want. You know, it just, it would depend on the terms and it would depend on how much I would be getting. It would be, it would de depend on how long I would have to abstain from atheist religious talk. Uh, terms are very important, but you know, it's certainly something I would consider. Adam Rainstopper. Hey, Steve, I recently saw a comment on a video about Bill Cosby that read something to the effect of, if Cosby was a white conservative, he would be hanged. Does anyone actually believe this? I mean, there are tons of people who come up with excuses and apologetics to cover the gulf in sentencing between white and, for instance, black offenders of the same age, from similar economic backgrounds, with similar criminal histories, who stand convicted of the same offense. However, I occasionally run into someone who just outright denies it, and even claims that white people are handed harsher punishments under similar circumstances, and that white conservatives in a country that is predominantly white and overwhelmingly conservative in centers of power are being systematically persecuted. How does this happen? Can these people ever be reached? I wouldn't want to say that you can't ever reach any of those people, but I, I would say it's probably a waste of time to spend too much energy trying to reach any one particular individual who is of that mindset. I think the best thing to do if you care about reaching those people is to present the best, strongest, most persuasive possible case you can for your position and put it out there and hope that you'll reach those that are reachable in that way. Um, because the truth is, if, if you are at the point where you're just flat out denying that that particular kind of discrimination exists, then you're probably, you're probably not reachable, at least not at that point, or at least you're, you're not receptive to hearing the truth. Because the truth is that kind of discrimination that you describe specifically uh, white person, black person, similar histories, convicted of the same crime, white person gets off relatively easy, black person gets harsh sentence. That, that kind of thing exists. That's real, you know? That's, that, and you can't explain that away by appealing to any other factor. You can't say, well, it's because black people commit more crimes. It's, a, it's, a, it's an apples to apples comparison and disproportionately black folks get harsher sentences than white folks convicted of the same crime. That's just the way it is. And there's no escaping that. And I think that's why folks who are invested either emotionally or politically or for some other reason in pushing this false narrative that, that systemic racial discrimination doesn't exist and it's certainly not a part of our justice system, that's why they'll just they'll, they'll, they'll avoid mentioning that. And if it's brought up to them, they'll just they'll ignore it or they'll deny it. Because there's what else can they do? What else can they do? There's no other explanation for that other than racist discrimination exists in the justice system.
And if that's if your argument is no, it doesn't, then you can't deal with what you were talking about in that question. Justin Parallax, Steve, if I write a poem about you, would you read it out? I call it Shives and Soda. Well, and you have already written a poem, Justin, clearly. So yes, I will read it out. Can we get a little... Cool. Okay. Beat down baseball cap, five o'clock shadow, night taste on the tip of your tongue like gin-soaked olives. Words break on shores of digital sand, and somewhere in the space between forever and here, you find yourself standing beside a small, ragged dog called Stuffy. It's been a long road to get here, and the road is longer yet. And when you have years ahead to live under the boot, under the boot and the storm and the froth of the words of a tin pot tyrant with orange for hair, you feel an urge to grab a brush and paint the city with all the words you can scream. But there is only so much time in the day and only so many words in the way. So we sit back and watch an old rerun of Star Trek because what else can we do? And what else can we be if not filming another Friday Q&A? and finding your comment section full of Mad Bastard's poetry written for Stuffy and me. I'm no Garrison Keeler, but I hope I did okay. Corey Donaldson, what is your opinion on people, especially conservative politicians, who publicly out same-sex people? Because in my home province of Alberta, Jason Kenney, who is the leader of the Progressive Conservative Party, thinks that the parents of same-sex students should have the right to know if their children are same-sex, and I think it is very unfair of Jason Kenney to do that, don't you? I think outing a gay person against their will uh, without their permission is inexcusable. It's, it's a horrible violation of privacy. It can open them up to violence, to danger. If you're talking about kids who are in school, I mean, they're, they're, even in today's, you know, more tolerant and open-minded society compared to many years ago. I mean, there are still, there are kids who are, who are outed as gay or as trans or, or some other, uh, you know, unacceptable identity who are ostracized by their family, who find themselves without a safe place to live, who are subjected to terrible discrimination and threats of violence and perhaps even actual violence. Um, it's, it's, it's horrible. It's inexcusable to suggest that students who are closeted about their sexuality in some way should be forcibly outed uh, by the school, no less. It's awful. It's a terrible suggestion. And, and the, the politician, uh, Jason Kenney, who suggests that, is, 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 should be ashamed of himself. It's, a, it's an awful thing. No, of course not. You should never out a person who doesn't want to be outed. That is not your decision to make. The whole reason why they're in the closet in the first place and don't feel at liberty to be themselves openly is because society is so shitty toward people like them. And if they want to out themselves and, and make themselves susceptible to the shittiness of society directed at people like them, that has to be their decision. They have to decide that that's something they want to do. And if they haven't made that decision and you happen to know that they are in the closet, the only thing you are ethically able to do is to keep your fucking mouth shut. Let them decide when they come out. It is no one's decision but that person's. And to forcibly out them for any reason is, is completely inexcusable, especially if you're talking about kids in school who are mo even more vulnerable to the intolerance and the discrimination directed at gay people and trans people, etc., than adults are. It's absolutely inexcusable. Animation! Hey Steve, I was recently reflecting on my community's collective horror at the knowledge that I'm a liberal. It amuses and baffles me that in a country that supports a two-party system, I'm ostracized for choosing one of the two main parties. But when I thought about it more closely, I remembered my grandfather and father very clearly referring to the Democrats in a thinly veiled euphemism for all black people. This was a commonly used phrase growing up in the Deep South. Is this a euphemism used in other parts of the country? Have you ever heard of black people collectively referred to as Democrats in a derogatory way? I have only ever lived in the Deep South, so I don't have any other context to draw from, so I wondered if it was a widespread taboo across the U.S. for a white person to identify as a liberal. I have never heard that specific term used where I'm from. I've lived my whole life in here in Western Maryland, which is not quite the South. It's sort of the, the, the northernmost 
boundary of the South, and some of our culture here is very Southern, some of it is not. Um, but there, there, there is a stigma to being liberal or, or being a Democrat, being left wing in any measure around here because it's a very conservative area. Um, but I don't recall any specific connection of uh, white people identifying as liberals or identifying as Democrats being linked to black people or, or Democrats being a, uh, a euphemism for black people, at least not, not that I'm aware of. There is a lot of uh, using the, the democratic or the liberal support historically for the civil rights movement and for black rights uh, as a reason not to like them. You know, there is a lot of very casual and also not so casual uh, white supremacy where I live and the fact that the Democratic Party is and has been for many, many, many decades the party of, of uh, people who support black rights and, and support civil rights and, 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 and LGBTQ plus rights and women's rights, that is definitely used to uh, denigrate Democrats and to, and to invite ridicule to Democrats, you know. They're the party of, of uh, those people. And I have heard people say that, that white people who are Democrats are N-word lovers. I've heard that many times, but I've never heard Democrat itself used as a euphemism for uh, black folks or, or in the way you're describing. So I, that, I don't know, maybe, maybe it is used places outside the Deep South, but I've never heard it around here. But using the Democratic Party's support for black folks and for black rights as an insult to Democrats and specifically to white Democrats, yeah, yeah, I've heard that. Uh, I've heard that before. And you've heard all this before as well, so instead of stumbling over my words and trying to come up with a clever segue, which I am never able to do, I will just say that you know what the bell means. It means that it's time for... The Lightning Round! Lucas Hackett, yo Steve, if there was ever a rematch between Freddy Krueger or Jason Voorhees, who do you think would win this time? I mean, it's a little bit like, you know, who would win a fight between Batman and Superman? And the answer is whoever's book it was in. If Superman comes to Batman's book and fights then Batman's going to win. If Batman comes to Superman's book and picks a fight, Superman's going to win. So it really, it depends on who's writing it. If I were writing it, Freddy would win because to me, Freddy is the baby face in that fight. I prefer Freddy to Jason. So if I was writing it, Freddy would win. Uh, Radical Bacon. I really want to see you and Jason in the same room. I'm pretty sure you haven't met in real life, but your friendship is pure and true. Who would hug the other first? No, we haven't ever actually met in real life. Um, but if, we, if, if and when we ever meet, I think Jason will hug me first, but that's because uh, he's, he's, tr he's going in for the hug to thwart me because I'm going in for the kiss. <laughs> and he would dodge. That's his defense. He dodges and goes in for the hug before I can land the kiss. So that's, that's how that would happen. Uh, uh, Johnny the Wolf. Hey, Steve. Speaking of Steve Shives documentaries... Have you considered making a special episode of Late Seating where you and Jason Harding make fun of the embarrassing attempt at a documentary that was made about you? Um, we just got done saying how pure and good my friendship with Jason is. I would never subject him to that. I would never force him to watch a quote-unquote documentary that some shitlord dipshit made about me. Uh, but I will say this. Uh, if Angus invites me back on Very Public Spanking and they want to do that, they want to watch the Steve Shives documentary, I would consider that. Because I've never even watched it. <laughs> and I, I can't think of any other circumstance where I would waste however long it is watching it than something like that. But maybe that. But no, not an episode of Late Seating. I would never I would never subject Jason to that unless it was in the company of many friends. And then we can sort of, we can, you know, spread it around. Uh, Samuel Sturgill. Steve, what if all this time Trump is kind of like Bruce Wayne? He just pretends to be a big jerk face so no one will suspect that he is really Batman. Now, if Trump were Bruce Wayne, even if Bruce were pretending to be a jerk face, I'm pretty sure Bruce Wayne would still wear suits that fucking fit. Uh, Francois Lacombe, a random thought I had watching Stephen Stuffy yesterday. I think Prospector Jones and Squirrel would make a wonderful couple. Agree? Disagree? No, I, yeah, I can see that. I, I would agree. I, I have other plans for Squirrel at the moment. But who knows what could happen in the future? You never know. Maybe at some point, if I keep making stuffy videos long enough, they'll probably all pair off eventually. Because that's what happens when you run out of creative ideas. When your well is running totally dry creatively and you're doing a show, you just start pairing characters off. 
That's how it always goes. Uh, Steven Sobel. Hey, Steve, film question. Do you have any favorite weird movies? I know weird is a vague and relative term, but certainly you know that type of movie that moves from scene to scene, leaving the viewer thinking, wait, what just happened on a regular basis? A lot of David Lynch's work is like this, but I figure you know of more. Side note, listening to you and Jason on late seating, as well as YouTuber folding ideas, has really changed the way I watch movies. Thank you both. Well, thank you, and thank you very much for the comparison to Folding Ideas, because he is awesome. Dan is is an amazing critic and, and YouTuber and, and video essayist. I'm flattered by anything that puts me next to him. So I'm glad that you've enjoyed Jason and I on Late Seating and that we've helped you out there. Um, favorite weird movies. Uh, Darren Aronofsky's first movie, Pie, was really good. Um, yeah, I mean, I love David Lynch. I, that, that That's sort of a no-brainer. Um, Magnolia is kind of weird in a way with the, uh, the, the, the frogs and everything. I, I, would, I would put that in there. Um, what else? What else is a good weird movie? Oh, there's a really cool sort of indie under the radar horror movie that my wife and I love that she watches a lot uh, called May. That is a really wonderful weird movie. So I, I would throw that in there as well, just, just off the top of my head. I'm sure there are others that I can't think of. But if you haven't seen May and you like weird horror movies. May is, is, is a really good one to check out. Uh, Kaboom, Kaboom Splat Yuck 2. Steve, I like you a lot, but would it be possible to temporarily hand over your channel to someone who isn't a short, white, underfed, vegetarian nerd with a beard, center-left opinions, the absolute conviction that he is the most boring man in the entire universe, and the absolute certainty that he will never leave rural Maryland? Maybe let H. Bomber Guy, Captain Andy, or Christy Winter star in a Stephen Stuffy video, or let them do a You Had to Ask? You're awesome, but I feel as though I know what you think about everything under the sun. Can we have a bit of change, please? You, you know, you, you're you more than welcome to watch their channels. The, all the people you mentioned have their own wonderful, amazing YouTube channels where they do fine work, which I assume you've been watching because you know who they are. Um, you really think the H-Bomber guy is going to slum it and come on this motherfucker? I, I, I think you, you, you either overestimate my pull or you underestimate H-Bomber guy's... Uh, uh, willingness to, yeah, no, it's not going to work. I don't even know where that was going. I hit underestimate and I thought that doesn't make sense what I'm about to say. Anyway, see, that's another reason why he wouldn't, he, he, he wouldn't be here. Um, and also, I, am I, do I strike you as short? I don't, I don't consider myself short and I don't, I mean, I think I'm properly fed. I wouldn't say I'm underfed. Do you think I'm underfed? I'm going to give my ass a complex, man. I'm not short, underfed. Everything else is about right though. Uh, low gravity logician. Hey Steve, I have a question myself. What is your take on the 4chan poster campaign? The one with the it's okay to be white message. Many people across the nation are upset and obviously college students. I've seen news reports stating that it's a racist statement and others saying it very much isn't despite the origin being the far right. Well, of course it's fucking racist. Yes, it's racist. It's okay to be white. That presumes that, that there is a, a prevailing opinion that it's not okay to be white, which there isn't. It's just like uh, all lives matter or white lives matter or you will not replace us. It's, it's white victimization, which is racist. It's perpetuating the false narrative that, white, that, that whiteness in and of itself is being attacked, that white people are being attacked and criticized and insulted and what have you for being white, that, that any, any time you try to call out or draw attention to or change white supremacy, that you are in fact attacking white people across the board for being white. That is racist. That is, that yes, so the it's okay to be white message is, is a racist message being pushed to the benefit of racists who want to be racist without being called racist. Yes, of course, it's, ooh, it's racist. Joshua Purvis, hey Steve, how are you? Hope you're doing well. Uh, my question is, what are some of your favorite matches from the Attitude Era from WWE? Thank you, Steve, for answering my question. Well, thank you, Joshua, and thank you for, for always asking questions. Um, favorite Attitude Era matches? Let me see. I love, um, well, one of the last great Attitude Era matches, Austin versus Rock from WrestleMania uh, X7. That's got to go way up there. I love that one. Uh, the Mick Foley Triple H matches from early 2000. Their match at the Royal, or at the Royal Rumble and then their rematch at uh, No Way Out that year. Both just fucking spectacular. Uh, let me see. The Rock versus Triple H ladder match from Fully Loaded. Uh, or not, not, yeah, was it Fully Loaded? No, it was SummerSlam. SummerSlam 98. Uh, that's a good one. There are lots of really great. Oh, um, it's a little hard to 
think about now because of what happened with Benoit, obviously, but uh, uh, Jericho and Benoit versus Austin and Triple H on Raw from 2001. Oh, fantastic match. Uh, yeah, those are some of my favorites. Hey, that's it for the questions. That's it for the lightning round. It's time now for the shout out. And the shout out this week goes to a radio show slash podcast that I may have given a shout out to before a long time ago. I can't remember, uh, but I'm giving it another shout out if indeed I gave it a shout out already. Whatever. I'm giving it a shout out this week because I, I was on the show and I just am a oh, a ham and I promote myself shamelessly. So the shout out this week goes to Atheist Talk, which is a product of Minnesota Atheists and is aired live every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Central Time uh, on a.m. 950. So if you're in the Twin Cities area in Minnesota, you can listen to it live every Sunday morning and you can also listen to it after the fact in podcast form at uh, am950radio.com or at atheisttalk.libsyn.com. The links, as always, are in the description of the video. And I was a guest this past weekend, along with the wonderful uh, Stephanie Zvan, who I was thrilled and honored to be on the show with, because I love Stephanie. I've talked about her before on the show as well. She's terrific, one of the great bright lights in the atheist community. And we talked about the importance of platforms, uh, who gets one, what it means, and it was a great show, it was a great talk. And then we also did a little bonus for people who are Patreon patrons of Atheist Talk, uh, where we talked for an extra half hour about, uh, it wound up being like a nerd conversation. We talked about sci-fi and comics, and it was just a ton of fun. So uh, if you find yourself becoming a patron of Atheist Talk, uh, then you can hear that one as well. So that's the shout out, Atheist Talk, awesome atheist radio show slash podcast. I was happy to be a guest. Uh, thank you to Hertzy for inviting me and everybody there for having me. And go check out Atheist Talk if you've never heard it. It's a great show. Also, don't forget, next year, July 6, 7, and 8, TAC. The Atheist Conference coming to New York City. Get your tickets now. Reserve your hotel room at the beautiful Roosevelt Hotel now so you can be with us. I'm going to be there. Christy Winters is going to be there. Uh, Mandisa Thomas is giving the keynote address. You can go to uh, theatheistconference.com to hear a full, to see a full list of all the speakers that we have lined up so far and check back regularly for new speakers that are going to be added. There's going to be a ton of people there that haven't been signed up yet because we have until July before this thing actually happens. So there's a, a lot of road yet to travel before we actually get to TAC. But the, uh, the lineup that we have so far is just fantastic and it's only going to get better from here. So keep apprised of all the latest from TAC, the Atheist Conference. Buy your tickets, book your hotel now. Please join us in New York City next year, if at all possible. Come join us July 6, 7, and 8, 2018 for the Atheist Conference, TAC in New York City, baby. I also want to remind you, as I always do, to check out the Lemmy Listen family of podcasts. These are podcasts that are the product of the wonderful Jason Harding, he of the pure and good friendship with yours truly. And I also want to remind you, and specifically, to check out the Late Seating podcast, which is the podcast that uh, I co-host with Jason. And uh, it's a show where we take a fresh look at movies that have a reputation of either being good or bad. We give them a fresh review. We make fun of them. We go through what happens. We decide whether the movie deserves whatever reputation it has, whether it has a reputation as a great film or a really, really terrible film. You can listen to our most recent episode, which is a review going up today, this very day, brand new episode, our review of the Bugs Bunny Michael Jordan vehicle from 1996, Space Jam. And you can also listen to all of the past episodes of Late Seating and all of the episodes of all of the awesome Let Me Listen podcasts by going to lemmelistenpodcast.com, our Space Jam episode goes up today. So check that out and check out all the past episodes as well. Let me listen podcast.com. That's it, everybody. I'm out of here. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for your questions. I can't do this without your questions. So please do leave a comment on this video that you're watching right now and ask me your question for the next you had to ask video, because that's the way it works for me to do this. You have to ask. So leave a comment on this video and ask me your question for next time. I will answer as many of your questions as I possibly can. Nothing is too serious. Nothing is too silly. So get your questions in. Thank you ever so much. I appreciate it. That's it for me, everybody. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Take care.
Hey, you folks, one more thing before I go. Thank you so much once again for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like, share, subscribe, and also please consider helping me to make more videos like this one by supporting this channel through Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash Steve Shives to become a patron of this channel. See you next time.